Hi, I'm Mike Bellevue, and today I'm in Ewing, Virginia at the Wilderness Road State Park. And this is the home of Martin Station, which is a recreated colonial era, or actually revolutionary era, uh, fort and settlement. This is in the Powell Valley, and it's right exactly where Virginia, Tennessee, and Kentucky come together. And this was the farthest forward settlement for Europeans before the Kentucky settlements. The settlement was founded by Captain Joseph Martin in 1775. He had made an earlier attempt, but he'd been driven out by the Cherokee Indians. But in 1775, it stuck. And this became an important jumping off place for a lot of the expeditions moving into Kentucky. It's right at the Cumberland Gap, uh, just before it. So this was the big jumping off into the great unknown of Kentucky. So we're here at the raid at Martin Station, and I'm going to try to show you the people who come to the raid and some of the activities that go on here. And we're going to see a battle between the Cherokee and the settlers here at Martin Station. And I think it's going to be pretty interesting. So stick with me. Well, the recreated fort and settlement at Martin Station is the centerpiece of the Wilderness Road State Park in Virginia. And it really is beautiful. It's in a beautiful setting. Uh, it's in the Powell Valley, and it's right up against what they call the Ridge, which is the Cumberland Mountains. Now, this was my camp up on the hill, and what you're going to see is the view from my front porch every morning, all day, at the raid. Uh, I could see the fort, and I could see the ridge behind it, and it changed all the time. It was just absolutely beautiful. Uh, the sort of thing I could sit all day and watch the play of clouds going across that ridge. Even when the bad weather came, it was interesting to see those clouds come down the ridge and over the settlement. So, let's go take a look at it. Okay, so we're outside the front gate of Martin Station. And this is made with uh, palisaded logs, done picket style, sunk into the earth. And you can see the front gate is the swing-up variety, like a drawbridge, instead of swinging out like your garden gate does. So let's take a look inside and let's see what the fort itself looks like. All right, well, we're inside the fort right now. So you can see the station. It's very compact. It's built with uh, notch logs and uh, chinked. And we're just going to pan around and give you an idea of what it looks like. So we've got the cabins built basically up against a palisaded wall. This is very typical construction. You would see this at Boonesboro, Prickett's Fort, most wooden log 18th century forts are built like this, civilian forts. This is a nice tight little, little station. It would have protected the settlers in Powell's Valley from Indian raids. During the event, the fort was full of people. There were people visiting from the encampment up on the hill, as well as people who were there manning the fort and actually living in the buildings during the event. And those would have been some of the presenters and some of the volunteers of some of the participants in the raid actually lived in the fort or in its out cabins. And, uh, you know, craftsmen plied their trade inside the fort. So... We've got Mike Miller here, who is an outstanding flintlock rifle builder, who also serves as the Martin Station gunsmith during the event. And you can see him here in the gunsmith shop plying his trade. Not everybody at the event lives in the fort. Uh, most of the people who attend the event were up on the hill in the 18th century encampment. And I've showed you a picture of my camp. And it's just one of many uh, similar 18th century camps that were up on the hill, populated by people from all 50 states. And it was a, uh, a very diverse and very interesting group of campers, a lot of fun to be with. In the woods, there was the Native American village. Uh, one of the features of that is a Cherokee Indian roundhouse. Uh, beautifully built and furnished and being lived in by some of the native reenactors, of, of which there were quite a few. And we'll, we'll show you them in just a minute. We'll just pan around the village here. There's more than native camp here. You can see they've got shelters going back into the woods over here.
the presence of so many Native American reenactors really gives the raid at Martin Station an authentic 18th century flavor. You feel like you're really on the frontier. And these are dedicated Native American reenactors. They do an outstanding job. Uh, just absolutely authentic. And obviously without them, there would be no raid at Martin Station. So this is just a, a wonderful event for them. And, and I think one of the premier events for Native Americans. And it certainly added a great deal to my enjoyment of it. Because of where my campsite was, a lot of people walked by uh, right in front of my camp. Uh, either on their way to Market Fair or heading over to the fort or heading over to the native village. So I had quite a few of the native reenactors passing by and a number of them sat down and uh, spent some time talking with me and I have to say I really enjoyed it. I look forward to seeing them again. I'm down here at the registration area right now and this is also the Market Fair. So as you can see we've got some blanket traders here. But we've got an entire market fair area set up. It's a whole little village of vendors, and I'm going to stroll around. Well, at the Raids Market Fair, you could pick up everything from buffalo robes to rifles and everything in between, as long as it was 18th century. So I'll just run you through a few pictures of uh, what was there at the market fair. I love to watch artisans perform actual 18th century crafts. And this is Dwight Mullieu, better known as the Shark, and he makes quill pens. You can change a lot. Cut the end off, simple. I cut them at an angle just to make it easier to bank the point. You split it. There. Okay. Make sure the point comes together, carve it nice. Right on that point, come into the crack. I've already made one today that didn't meet on the crack and it wouldn't write a line. Okay, now the point comes together right on the crack and you make one last cut. Don't have any idea why. I suspect it might be so it rests on the, off the paper. Close the knife blade so you don't cut your hand while you're sitting here. Then to properly trim it, you either cut a flag or you cut it all the way down once you only dip the point. Make sure you close your ink well so it doesn't get knocked over and spill. Yeah. Doesn't hold very much ink, but it writes good. Never know. I had one a while ago that wrote 12 or 14 words. This one wrote half of one. You never know until you dip it in the ink and start writing. And Missy Clark is an expert on 18th century fabric and tailoring, and here she's doing something very unique. She's carding silk. Let's take a look. So what are you doing, Missy? I am carding spent silk, or actually it would be called raw silk. Um, it's done in this fashion when the cocoons have hatched. 
um, then the moth has flown away, the spent cocoons are harvested and scrubbed to remove the sarin, which is the glue that holds them together. Um, they're scrubbed and then taken apart, just cut apart and then carded like this and then it's spun just the same way that you would spin wool or, or linen. Um, the other way that silk is done is the whole cocoon is heated in boiling water and scrubbed off and the cocoons are about this big and I could show you one if I would have gotten it out. Um, cocoons are about this big and they unreal. That's that's the way I had always heard that it was done. That's I never, right. never saw this before. I, this is how the cocoon looks after the after the larva has spun it. He begins on the outside whipping his body in a figure eight, his mouth. The this is actually the spit from from the silkworm. Anyway, he starts whipping around in a figure eight like this until he gets it all wound up close to his body. And then he goes to sleep or he moves into the pupa state. And then after um, twenty days he hatches, he or she hatches out into a moth. And you, so anyway, when these are going to be used in this form of silk, these are put into boiling water and the outside scraped and scrubbed, and then it comes undone. And you put 10 of them together and you reel it out and it becomes one long string. There's about a mile in each one. But if we did that with all of them, then there would be no future silkworms, correct? Mm -hmm. Because there wouldn't be any moths that can hatch. Now, if you can listen, can you hear that? Yeah. Those are the dead worms on the inside there. Wow. And so that when I unreel these, there will be a dead worm in the bottom of the bowl. Now, so the ones that were able to escape, they crack open and they get themselves out and then they become the silk moth. And then they live for another couple weeks and then they lay their 500 eggs if they're a female and it all begins again. And so the silk that was spent, or that the cocoon had hatched, or the pupa had hatched out, that is used and carded like this. So there's two kinds of silk. And there you go, thank you. Well, there were a number of presenters uh, and speakers at the raid, and one of them was Suzanne Larner, and she presents an actual historical character Mad Ann Bailey. And uh, in this particular presentation, uh, she was talking about historical one, trekking and off with a group went. of women. It and it was that same path that the ladies and I endeavored to pursue. Now let me tell you, a traveling group of women is a lot like a traveling group of turkeys. And if you want to know why they're like a group of turkeys, well, you'll just have to catch Mad Ann Bailey at another event. <laughs> well, the centerpiece of the event, the raid at Martin Station, are the battle scene reenactments that take place on Saturday at 1 in the afternoon and at 8.30 in the evening. And uh, I'm going to cover those in great detail in the next video in the series, which will be all about the battles. But in the meantime, here's just a little taste of it, and I hope you'll join me for part two and watch the battle scenes. I'll see you there. Oh, here you are, clown. I want to give special thanks to Billy Heck, the chief ranger of the Wilderness Road State Park, a dedicated 18th century reenactor, and he is the driving force behind the raid at Martin Station. Uh, he's the guy who keeps all the balls in the air to make sure this thing happens without a hitch every year, and he did a fantastic job. So thank you, Billy.